So now I'm going to talk about the four main factors that influence function. Number one, the person. That's you. You are unique. You bring your interests, your passions, your work, and your relationships. You have your physical, cognitive, emotional strengths and limitations. You have other conditions affecting you, which may or may not have been made worse by your Parkinson's. Then you have the direct effects of Parkinson's. I think we're all pretty familiar with the motor effects of Parkinson's, those motor symptoms, most common being tremor, stiffness, slowness, problems with coordination, problems with balance. Then there are the non-motor symptoms. There are really too many to mention, but I'll, I'll name a few. So sleep disturbances, which can also lead to daytime fatigue. Digestion problems, starting with chewing and swallowing and working their, ways, their way all the way down to the gut and the slowness of the gut or constipation. Attention span, the speed of thinking, mood changes, pain, often in the shoulder, the back, sometimes in the feet, sometimes in the neck. Visual issues, often that would be double vision or difficulty seeing contrasts. Lack of expression, that can take many forms. It can be your facial expressions or it could be the changes in your voice when you try to express yourself verbally. It could be your gestures, dizziness, and there are so many others. One that I want to make particular note of is sensation. That's what you need in order to keep track of where your body parts are and what they're doing. So a part of that involves those automatic movements that should be occurring without you having to think about them. You've practiced them all of your life. You aren't even aware that you're doing them, but they're very important to your functioning. Some of those that you've probably already heard about would be arm swing is diminished with Parkinson's. Posture is hard to maintain. It feels like you're always being pulled down forward. Visual scanning, even just looking at what you're doing sometimes doesn't occur as automatically as it should. And of course, the footwork, that you turn your foot or you, you place your feet where you want them before you start to move. Then there's this thing called underscaled effort. And you see that whenever you watch somebody trying to get out of a chair. If it takes them three tries to really get up, you know that the first two lacked significant effort. They didn't put enough umph into it to get out of the chair. Of course, there's another problem that they were probably experiencing too with body mechanics, but I'll get into that later. The other part of sensation that happens is that you might be able to make a good first effort but then as you go along, that effort diminishes. You see this a lot with walking. So you can take a nice big step to start, but then each step after that gets smaller and smaller, especially if you're distracted from thinking about your steps. And pretty soon you get that shuffling sound. And you know what that means. It means that your feet just really aren't you're not really picking up your feet and moving them in a big way. All right, so using some basic principles, we can begin to address some of the issues that are common to Parkinson's. One of them is your base of support. So where are your feet? If they're nice and wide, you're going to be able to move freely without feeling like you're going to fall over. If not, if they're close together or tucked underneath you, you're going to lack the stability that you need, even for something that doesn't seem related like handwriting. 
or getting dressed. You really need to have the stability of your feet on the floor in order to feel confident about the other things that you're trying to concentrate on. So weight shifts. Weight shifts allow you to take your weight off of one foot in order to move it. If your weight is dead center on both feet, you really can't move this one effectively. And so you begin to rely on tipping yourself forward in order to get the feet to move. And that's not only ineffective, it's dangerous. So the other thing about weight shifts is it allows you to move well from one position to another. So if I'm sitting, my weight is all on my hips, but if I want to stand, I need to get half of my weight in front of my feet. So that means that I really have to push low and way forward to get my weight out, my upper body weight out in front of my feet, and that's going to balance out my hips. A lot of people, when they think about standing, are just thinking about going straight up and they don't shift the weight, so it, it makes the task a whole lot harder for them. Uh, you can do it by pushing up, but you're using an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of effort to do it. All right, the next one is rotational movements. Those are nice for loosening up the joints, helping you feel like you can move better, but they also give you power. So if you think about a baseball player, if they were to just stand there and move the bat back and forth, they have no power. When a 95 mile an hour ball comes at them, they're not going to be very successful. So what they do is they rotate and then they push through and that gets the whole body involved in the activity and gives them the power they need. We talk about the word amplitude in therapy and what that really means, it's just a big word that means bigness. So the size of your movements. You want your movements, whether they're large or small, to be as big as they can be. So how do we do that? How do you make a small movement bigger? Well, say you're gonna make a fist, that's a small movement. And you can do it like this, or you can do it like that. So that's amplitude. I'm putting, I'm putting a lot of effort into that. And I'm also going to the full extent of the movement. I'm getting it as tight as I can get it. The same goes for the big move. So the opposite of tight squeeze is big and open. You can do it with your whole body. You can get your face into it by squeezing really tight and then opening really big. Or you can just do it with your whole body all at once. Really tight, really big. Why do we do that? It looks kind of weird. We do it because we want you to feel what's going on in your body. And the last basic principle or thing that we tend to look at as therapists is posture. Why? There are so many reasons. If you have a person bent forward, then their, their head and their shoulders are always going to be out in front of their feet and their feet are going to have to shuffle to keep up with them. So you're already off balance if your posture is bent forward. And that's a typical Parkinson's posture is to have a slight bend in the, the knees and the hips, a slight curve forward in, in the shoulders. Pain is another reason why you want to have good posture. If your shoulders are slumped forward and you're sitting kind of like, they call it a cashew nut posture, then what you have to do to make eye contact is to lift your chin up and that's going to create a little dip in the back of your neck that's bigger than it really should be. And over time, that can cause a lot of neck pain. Same for any other part of your posture. If, 
if your posture is not good, it's going to cause pain somewhere. Increasing your lung capacity. So you can imagine if your posture is forward flexed, it's going to squish those lungs and you're not going to have the same capacity as if you were upright, chest up, shoulders back. You've got all this air exchange that's possible. So that can be helpful for uh, certainly aerobic fitness, but it can also be helpful for other things like the strength of your swallow or the volume in your voice. You have to have a lot of air exchange in order to have volume. Having good posture automatically tells your nervous system that you need to pay attention. It's very much like standing at attention if you were a soldier. When you're in that upright position, your body somehow knows that you need to pay attention to what's going on. And of course, it helps you to make direct eye contact with the person with whom you're speaking. And so you can communicate more effectively. You can also scan down the pathway that you're walking and, and see what's in front of you as opposed to when your head is turned down because your shoulders are slumped forward or your hips are bent forward. And it's almost like you're looking down through a periscope. You have no plan for what's in front of you if you can't look down the road and see it. But once you glance in front of you, your brain is so quick to develop a, a plan of action. And then if those aren't good enough reasons, I will say that this probably looks better than that. Other factors having to do with you, the person, might be your overall physical conditioning. How active are you with your, what we call in occupational therapy, activities of daily living or ADLs? Are you still trying to do as much as you can for yourself in your home, with your personal care, etc.? What kinds of exercises are most beneficial for you now? If you're a weightlifter, you might think that bicep curls are the things that you've always done, you love doing them, and they're really important. But with Parkinson's, you may never need to do another bicep curl in your life. What you really need to do is strengthen those muscles on the opposite side of your body, those ones that hold you upright. Another factor that I think is really interesting and important to look at when we're dealing with what people need to change about themselves is how good are they at dual tasking? We call this multitask training. Most everything we do involves divided attention. So I'm walking and I'm looking. I'm walking and I'm talking. I'm walking and I'm thinking. I'm walking and I'm carrying things. People with Parkinson's have to devote a lot more of their conscious effort to keep track of their posture and where their feet and hands are. So distractions can actually be kind of dangerous if you're not prepared. Freezing of gait, you may have heard of, is very common among people with Parkinson's who have trouble making quick decisions about where and how to move. So it's really important that you practice being able to make those quick shifts in your speed and direction of movement and also be able to quickly shift your attention from one thing to the next. I think driving is probably the ultimate challenge in uh, balancing out or holding multiple trains of thought at one time. All right, the next thing that we look at, the next factor, is the method or the way you go about doing what you're going to do. We've already talked about foot placement and posture, so I won't go into that anymore, but that is part of the method of how you do things. And it's usually the first thing I look at. I, my, my eyes go directly to your feet. So some other things that you might want to do or might want to take a look at to know if your methods are as good as they can be. Are you able to stay focused on the task? 
there are some little strategies that can help with this. Sometimes if you just verbalize what you're going to do, I am going to reach all the way back behind my shoulders and I'm going to grab that short shirt with a really firm grip. I'm going to take it all the way up and over until I get down to my knees on the other side and my shirt just magically pops off with so much uh, greater speed and less effort than it would have otherwise. So another part of that is just being really dramatic in your movements. Make them bigger than what you think. Um, another strategy might be, if your steps are too small, is to look ahead at where you're going and estimate how many steps do I think it's going to take me to get from, from here to there. That can be incredibly effective for somebody who tends to have freezing of gait or really shuffling steps. Another strategy is to stop when you get into a difficult situation, like a crowded room where you're going to have to make a lot of maneuvers to get from the entrance to the chair where you're going to sit. And you can actually stop and pre-plan your route. I'm going to go forward till I get to that place, then I'm going to take two steps to the side, then I'm going to go forward again, and I'm going to stand in front of my chair. It can be as simple as that, but it takes conscious thought. All right, sequencing. This is one of my personal favorites because I always think of airplane landings when people go to sit. Airplane landings are when you're thinking, you're probably in a hurry, and you're thinking more about getting your hips to land on that chair than you are about all the steps along the way that that requires. The first one is to walk over to the chair and stand in front of it. No doubt you've had PTs or OTs who have said, always make sure that you can feel the back or the chair with the back of your legs, and that is true. What they're really saying is, go stand right in front of that chair. Don't even think about sitting until you're standing where you need to stand. Your feet, again your feet, need to be in the right place. Then you put your landing gear in order. You bow down, you reach back, and you sit. Body mechanics is another strategy. We've talked a little bit already about this with sit to stand. You can do it with all activities, really. But using good body mechanics requires so much less effort. If, say, you want to get out of the chair, you're going to try to get your body to go low and forward to get you out of the chair. But what most people are thinking about is standing up and so they put all of their effort into trying to lift themselves up. However, that's going to take all kinds of effort, whereas if you simply leaned forward and got your head and shoulders out in front of your feet, you would find that you reach this balance point and all of a sudden standing up seems perfectly simple. Another strategy is organization. Have all of your supplies that you need in one place. Activity centers are a good way to do this. It saves a lot of steps. It saves a lot of energy. We keep talking about energy conservation and I could probably do a whole talk just on that, but these are all parts of energy conservation. Having a predictable routine is important too. Just like with organizing, it saves you a lot of energy if you know what's coming. If it's the same thing that you do in the same way every day, you know where things are, you know your moves, you can even practice those moves and make sure that you're really good at doing the, the different steps or getting the foot placement right to, say, make your pot of oatmeal in the morning or make your pot of coffee. Another strategy is to avoid time pressures. These can come in a lot of different forms, but certainly you don't want to try to do something that's hard for you to do 
when you feel like the clock is ticking. Or even worse, if your spouse is out in the car and they've got the car running and you just know that the pressure is on, you gotta hurry up. Hurrying usually takes your focus off of what you're doing, where it needs to be, and on to either the clock or the person who's waiting for you, neither of which is helpful. You might also want to think about avoiding timed situations that can increase your overall anxiety. Some examples of these would be crosswalks. You know that you only have so much time to get across and some are quicker than others. So you might find that uh, certain ones are going to be too anxiety provoking. Other things that are really difficult for people who have freezing of gait would be things like escalators or the worst ones of all are those revolving doors that you see in some hotels. So if you do have something that's important for you to do, but maybe it's a little bit difficult, try to plan those things along with your exercise during your on times. That's when your meds are working at their best. And another way that you might want to improve your method of doing things or improve your success is to throw a piece of adaptive equipment at it. These come in small forms and big forms. An example of something really small might be a button hook to make it easier for you to button with, a, with less tediousness, um, less fine motor movements required. You, you simply push, hold on to the hook, you push it through the hole, you hook the button and you pull it back through. So none of this required. You can also use a piece of rubber matting cut it into a length, roll it around a pencil, and you've got a nice pencil grip. Same thing could work for your toothbrush or an eating utensil to give you a little bit better grip and a bigger handle so it takes less strength and effort and concentration to hold on to it. A big piece of equipment, of equipment would be something like a U-step walker. That's a big walker that has uh, it's in a U shape and it has a laser beam that runs across the floor so that you've always got a target for your feet and that can be very effective for some people who have freezing of gait. So the third thing that we that we look at the third factor is environment. When you're looking at changes to the environment you want to focus on a number of things. First your environment should be safe. You might look at any slipping or tripping hazards and they come in all forms. It could be a little snag in a rug. It could be a cord across the pathway. It could be a pet that likes to park itself in front of you. You want to address barriers in your home, the things that keep you from doing what you need to do. For example, a lot of people are intimidated by a tub shower because it doesn't feel real safe to get their foot up and over and into the tub. In that case maybe again some adaptive equipment could help. You could put some grab bars in, maybe a tub transfer bench so that you could sit down and slide across to be inside your tub. And often people find that the tub shower that we adapt is even better than the stall shower that they thought would be the best fit. In your environment you also want to eliminate distractions and they come in all forms as well. It could be auditory uh, distractions, visual, just too much stuff around you when you're trying to focus in on what you're doing. You do want to have cues if they're helpful. These can come in the form of visual cues, like pieces of tape on the floor to mark where your feet will go. Auditory cues can be helpful too, and I'll get into that when we talk about how your care partners can assist you. You want to have, as we mentioned before, activity centers that are set up to perform your task as efficiently as possible. 
A really simple example of this is when you're in your bathroom at the sink, where is your hand towel? Is it behind you so that you have to make a turn? If you have freezing of gait and your feet don't want to easily turn or you don't shift your weight quickly enough to make that pivot turn, every time you try to turn around to reach that towel, you're putting yourself at an increased risk for a fall. Simple solution, even if you don't have a holder for your towel, is just put the towel on the counter in front of you. Another thing you want to look for in your environment is whether there are lots of crowds, noise, or confusion. And you probably have a lot more control of your home environment than you do when you go out. But you do have some control when you go out. Say grocery shopping. If you go on a Saturday mid to late morning, you know you're going to have a lot of working people who are trying to get in and out quickly. Whereas if you were to go on a Thursday morning, you might find that there are not as many crowds, you can get uh, through the lines quicker, you don't have people waiting for you to reach into your pocket or sign your check. So the fourth factor that influences your function is the amount and type of assistance that's needed. Occupational therapists do a lot of training of care partners or paid assistants who are there to help you. And some of the things that we like to emphasize that they might try doing is to, are to, notice positive changes. To practice using proper body mechanics themselves so that they don't injure themselves in trying to take care of you. To be able to effectively cue and communicate with you. And regarding this, I would say that the fewer words, the better when you're trying to cue somebody. One word, the word big, the word power, is so much more effective than trying to explain why or how you should be moving your feet. That's confusing, that's too much information. A demonstration might be more effective than any verbal cue. So you have to kind of find out what's right for you. You want to figure out what the easiest, safest, and most efficient way possible is for you as a caregiver. It's really important that you take the time to understand and learn about the motor and the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. That can go a long way towards understanding why your partner does what they do. You want to know how to use any pieces of adaptive equipment that we've placed in the home so that you can be safe. Uh, pieces of equipment can be quite dangerous if you don't know how to use them. A perfect example is someone who doesn't lock the brakes on their four-wheeled walker and then turns around to sit down and the walker slides out from under them. And you want to be able to anticipate problems before they occur. So if you know the tendencies of the person that you're working with, then you might know as you go around and look at where they spend their time that that office chair on rollers might not be the safest thing for them because they tend to do airplane landings and that chair could slide right out from under them and cause a fall. So another thing about caregiving that's important is knowing when to help. You want to help when it's important to ensure safety. You want to help when it reinforces new learning to prevent unnecessary frustration or fatigue. So you may even have a closet that's full of clothes where you have one set of shirts that are independent all the time. You may have another set of shirts that you need help with if you're in a hurry but otherwise the person can do it themselves and they should. Then you might have another set of shirts that have lots of buttons, maybe they're a little bit tighter fitting, a little bit fussier and you like them for certain occasions so those are the ones that you're going to help with all the time. You want to help when it's 
to encourage a person to use their best effort or their best amplitude or bigness of movement. And again, a simple word like big can be the best thing that you say. And you want to give wanted feedback at the wanted times. So you might be perfectly free to give feedback when you're in your own home, in your own setting, and your partner is very comfortable with that. But it might feel embarrassing to them if you're giving them feedback when they're out in public or in a social setting. So in conclusion, I hope that you found this sampler platter of strategies helpful. I hope that you can also partner with an occupational therapist or a team of therapists that can address your very specific and unique needs. Take care of yourselves and stay active.